everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and welcome to another episode of Dye Pot Weekly. Today we're going to dye some skeins of yarn that are twisted in a catering steam pan and we'll layer some liquid dye, retwist the yarn, layer more dye, etc. until I'm satisfied with the final color. It's been a while since I've done this technique and I'm excited to play around with it. Before I talk about the colors today, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to today's lab partner, Aisha. Aisha, thank you so much for being my lab partner for today's episode of Dye Pot Weekly. And if you at home would like to learn more about how you can become a lab partner and get shout outs in one of these videos, you can go and check out the listings in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop and I'll probably check more about this in the middle or end of the video. So anyway, Aisha, thank you so much for being my lab partner today. Today is a Thursday. Uh, so part of me was like, oh, I could say on Wednesdays we wear pink. But when I planned this video yesterday, it was Wednesday. So, and I'm not wearing pink anyway, because it's a Thursday. But <laughs> if you can't tell, and I'm definitely not making this work, <laughs> is that today we are going to play around with a lot of pink. And to do this and to make sure I pick pinks that will stand out from one another, we need to go back and take a look at the time that I swatched all of my pink acid dyes. Today we're going to go pink on pink on pink and layer a bunch of different pinks together. Now I want to make sure that the pinks that we're layering are different. They have different undertones slightly different hues, because if we were to do this technique with the same pink over and over, we would get sort of a tonal yarn, because there's going to be some areas where the new pink will go on top of white, and other areas where pink will go on top of the same pink, making that more saturated. So even if things are the same, we'd still end up with something really pretty, but I do want the undertones to be a little bit different. So here we're looking at some crude swatches of all of the pink dyes that I at least had at the point I did this video. And so one caveat here is that here I'm using dry dye powders, and so things might be a little bit more pigmented than they will be when we make solutions. But what you can look at, and especially near the edges of these colors, is you can get a feel for the undertones, which pinks lean way more orange like salmon, and which have sort of like a more soft pink, like Valentine blush, versus more neon, like fluorescent fuchsia. And so we can go through and pick some colors that do feel like they have different undertones. Now, looking at this selection of five colors that I've pulled, and I don't think I'll use all five, uh, Deep Magenta does look like it could be similar to Fluorescent Fuchsia, but I've dyed with those colors enough. I know they are very different. Fluorescent Fuchsia is a, pig, is a fluorescent pink, and Deep Magenta is a bright pink, but not neon. Berry Crush also seems like it'll be bright, but it is a lot more blue than the other colors. Uh, Cabernet is a little bit more dusty, more muted. And Flamingo Pink also has a softness to it and slightly more yellow without being peach. And here I have all of those colors that I was talking about sort of more next to each other. Uh, and I added Pink Orchid here, but I don't think I want to use Pink Orchid because Pink Orchid is an awesome color, but it strikes to yarn so quickly that I think if I were to use that the color would really just be at a very surface level and might not penetrate very much beneath the surface. I'll pull the color even though we aren't going to, I don't think I'll use it, just because it could be nice to have on hand. Here we have the six pinks in the same order that I had just pasted those swatches together. And the main thing I want to point out is that these will give some indication of how intense or saturated a color is when you mix it. So Flamingo Pink is much more of a pastel color than, say, Cabernet. But these don't always give an indication of, like, the undertone and things like that. So the crude swatches sort of equalizes the intensity of some of the colors a little bit, because if it's a pastel color, I might just use more of it. And it makes sure that if I pick a pastel, I know that the undertone of this pastel is different from one of the more saturated colors. Because sometimes a premixed pastel like silver gray might be very similar to using pastel true black or something like that. And so you want to make sure that you're picking things that when they get lighter, 
might feel different. I mean, if that's what you're going for, which we are, so. <laughs> I put on my Deluxe Rubber Respirator Mask, safety glasses, and gloves, and started measuring out some of the dye and dissolving it in hot tap water. We're gonna be dyeing 400 grams of yarn today, and I think we might just use three colors, even though I've pulled six, but I'm still gonna dissolve some amount of uh, the fluorescent fuchsia, flamingo pink, berry crush, and deep magenta in water. So then I can decide a little bit more which of the colors I might wanna use. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm not dissolving the pink orchid, and I already have a bit of a stock of Cabernet, so that's why I didn't take out some of those colors. The only reason why I'm weighing the different colors right now is so that way I don't take out too much or too little dye, but I'm aiming to have less than a gram of each of the colors. All right, we have our dyes and then a tiny little swatch over here of the liquid dyes. And over here we have Berry Crush Fluorescent Fuchsia, Flamingo Pink, Deep Magenta, and then Cabernet, which is looking a little bit brown here on the paper. I promise it's not brown once you dye it. Maybe, maybe it's like a heat thing or something like that. Ooh, but see, I'm inclined. Ooh, I think I wanna use the flamingo. The question is if we end up using four. Um, because, because we could dye everything with fluorescent fuchsia over the top to like go over some of the whites that we have. Okay, let's do Flamingo, Cabernet, and Berry Crush. And then we'll decide if we want some deep magenta or fluorescent fuchsia over whatever is left. This is my four inch deep full size catering steam pan. Um, and we're gonna be dyeing 400 grams of Wool to Die For's Crazy 8 Worsted. And what I'm doing right now is twisting up the yarn and sort of scrunching it in the pan. So there's some places where the twist is like a little over twisted, somewhere it's a little less, but we're getting some resist. And there's elements of this technique that are gonna feel similar to, see, I'll lower this, but I'm just twisting by the zip tie and holding it up, these are long skeins. Um, there's elements of this that are gonna feel similar to dyeing a twisted skein of yarn three times, but there's also parts of it that are different because uh, the amount of twist is, uh, varies a little bit more, and because especially at the beginning, since the yarn is gonna be sitting on the bottom of the pan, uh, this means that like that also provides an amount of resist. And as I layer the colors on, because there's one thing I didn't consider, that when we pour the colors on, I might not be pouring them down the entire skein, so we could end up with some color on like one half and not the other. We'll see what happens as we bring over our first colors. So it's occurring to me now that that's something that could be pretty fun. Now, I probably could have fit more yarn here. Um, I think that I could have fit, goodness, another 200 grams of yarn in here fairly easily. Um, but it's okay that we have things the way we do. And I think that this will be really fun. The yarn pre-soaked overnight in plain tap water. Okay, here is just a liter cup. I'm gonna bring in one tablespoon of white vinegar right now. This is about four cups of volume. Whew. And I'm debating, but I think I wanna go for two of the more saturated colors first. So I like measured out some Cabernet. So use about half of that. This is a lot of color. This might spread over everything. But now I'm gonna bring over some of the pre-soak water and bring that up so it's about a liter total. And I think what I want to do is create, let's do something like this. I'm going to create like a little 
barrier <laughs> here towards the center because hopefully as I pour the dye on um, I'm gonna pour it on up there hopefully it won't come down this way so I'm gonna pour it on top now there was still some liquid in our yarn and some of it is moving further down, um, which is okay. I haven't turned on the heat yet. There's a little bit left in here. I'm gonna go put this in another container and we're gonna prep the dye for the other side. Okay, once again, we have one tablespoon of white vinegar and I forget, I feel like it was around 0.7 grams of dye of the berry crush, but we'll add I don't know, three quarters. This is all dying by feel today. Hopefully this doesn't just tip over. Nope, we're pretty good. <laughs> and I'm going to bring this pink down here. And you can see how much brighter this one is. And now we definitely have some of this that's going down there. But we have some areas on top where the color is not moving. Cool. And so depending on how the twists are and how much things sink in, this is gonna give us some differences between what's on the top and what's on some of those sides. So I am now gonna turn on the heat and it's on high right now just to start heating things up. And so it's a good thing we do have liquid around the whole thing, but I'm gonna wanna keep a close eye on things because I don't want it to bubble too much. I don't want things to get too hot. And so we may decide we want to add more acid, but I love that I had a plan to just do things all over and then I decided to sort of split it. And so I'm really excited about this because this way if the Cabernet does take over, it's really only doing it up there and not down here. And so I'm excited. And I think that what will happen is like these areas that are sort of in between are gonna get a little bit more pigment. But again, we will see. And as for the rest of the Cabernet with vinegar and the Berry Crush with vinegar. I'm actually gonna pour those onto a Leave No Dye Behind project. That will be another video that will come out at some point. That way I just have these containers. I do still have more Cabernet and Berry Crush. If we need those, we can mix up some more. But I'm gonna try to use up the leftovers as we go along, and so I think that that could be fun. Okay, we're starting to get some steam. I'm reducing the heat to medium, and I'm gonna set a timer for 10 minutes. It's only been five minutes and I'm starting to see some colors clear. Uh, but what I wanna do is add just some little bits of acid into some of these areas. So maybe not even two other tablespoons of white vinegar, just like little bits, just to help. And if we don't clear all the color, that'll be okay. If I need to, I'll grab a yarn mop that we can throw in to soak up pinks if I feel like that's something I want to do. But anyway, we'll let the timer go. However, you'll notice that the Cabernet is definitely not looking brown. It's definitely looking Cabernet colored. Okay, after 10 minutes, and I'm reducing the heat to be pretty low, uh, I would say that we have almost all of the color cleared. And so I am not worried about what things are gonna do. But I'm now gonna pick up our yarn and let it untwist. I'm trying to wring out a lot of the water. Whew. And I'm just setting it aside because we're gonna need to retwist. But I'm glad we did things the way we did because at one end, we have some of that, what was it, the Berry Crush with some deeper Cabernet. We've got some whites in the middle. And then the other end is very Cabernet heavy. And so this is giving us something awesome to begin with. Now, I was originally gonna twist it multiple times, 
but they're so little white that I'm not going to. <laughs> oh my gosh, there is so little white left in here that I'm going to bring the yarn out and I'm going to put it in the pan untwisted. I can't believe this. This is so funny. All right, I'm turning the heat off uh, because, so we still have very little water in here, um, but we do have some amount of all of the yarn visible. <laughs> I can't believe this. I was so sure I was going to twist again, and I was like, but we don't have that much white, and I really want our next color, the flamingo pink, to show through. So I'm going to take about half of the flamingo pink, and I did measure out more than one gram of the flamingo pink. Okay, and I dissolved it in about one liter of liquid. But I'm now pouring this on. And see how that undertone is different from the other colors? It is a little bit more yellowish. This is hilarious. Okay, this one isn't quite a full liter. But I've poured it mostly on to this end that had the brighter color. I don't know how fast this color strikes, but I'm really happy with the coverage we got on that first layer. Like really, really happy. Okay. And now over here, I think I want just like a hint of some fluorescent fuchsia. So I measured out, I think about a half gram of the fluorescent fuchsia. I'm taking like a tiny amount of the dye that I measured out. Dissolved it in a lot of water. And then I'm layering it down there. Now, we don't know what's happening on the other side yet. We don't know if we're gonna need to add more of anything, right? I don't know if I'll need, uh, there's not that much left. No, I'll, I'll save it. Or bring it over to the leave no day behind. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna try to push things down this way. I don't want things to spread out too, too much. Those flamingos did strike pretty quickly. It's okay if there are some whites, oh, but isn't this fun? And the fluorescent fuchsia is bringing a little bit of the brightness down. I think things are way, oh, it won't let me adjust. Okay, that's a little better. Somehow I had locked uh, the exposure. I'm going to turn the heat back on because we, it's, things are still warm, but we added a lot of water. Uh, I think that this is gorgeous. Now, if our other colors had struck faster, so if I think I had more liquid in here, then the Cabernet wouldn't have sunk into the yarn as much as I did, especially because we were pouring it on top, that dye just went through. And we got the color uneven, which is what we wanted, but I think that there are ways we could have set this up so that way we would be able to retwist and have the color just mostly be on the outside versus going through as much. And so this is all good and okay, uh, but we just went with the flow. And so I'm obsessed with this. <laughs> I am absolutely obsessed and I just adore how these colors have all come together. Oh my goodness. Okay, I am gonna let this heat for I think 15 minutes. I mean, those fluorescent pinks, which there's not a lot of it, uh, will take more time. The flamingo has basically absorbed. Uh, I will add one, two, three, four, five more tablespoons of white vinegar. Maybe a little overkill, but that way we have it. So we'll check back in after 15 minutes and see if we need to We'll flip the yarn and decide if we need more dye. The one thing I will say now about having the yarn twisted in the pan is it meant that as I was adding the dye, I knew that all four skeins were getting similar amounts. Whereas right now, 
it's hard to say, okay, is this skein more underneath one of the others? And so it's possible that there's some more differences at this stage with what's happening with the various skeins. But so when they're twisted, you have a little bit more control, uh, at least at that beginning stage. Alrighty, it's been 15 minutes and we're gonna flip the yarn. Um, I will say I did peek and uh, I saw that like the pinks had all pretty much absorbed as I'm trying to get this. But I'm curious, once we flip, yes! Oh good, I'm seeing, we got, because of the like water volume that we had, we, there might be some whitish patches, but I feel like we got a lot of that flamingo all the way through. I am happy. It's okay if there's some whites. I love this. And so this is a video that is a great example. I guess I'll hop in front of the camera in a minute, but uh, I'm going to set another timer for 15 minutes to finish this off. Oh, Aisha, I hope you're so excited. Today's video is an example of how sometimes when I'm dyeing yarn, I start off with a plan. And I'm like, okay, I want to twist yarn three or more times, add color each time, layer it, let's go. But then I see it in the pan and I'm like, okay, wait, we'll start with two colors. And then I open it up and I think, I don't need to twist it anymore. I think we're pretty good. And so through the video, instead of going with my original plan, I saw what was happening with the yarn and I pivoted and adjusted the plan to create something I felt was beautiful. And so as fun as it is to do an experiment or a project and not stop halfway through, it's okay to stop partway through and change what you're going to do and to be inspired by the effects that you're seeing on the yarn. Uh, this is something that, I don't know, I really love to do and something that happens a lot when I do like a leave no dye behind type of colorway, when I'm really just trying to use up the dye in any way possible and letting whatever the colors are doing speak to me. So I hope that that does make some sense. And so I think that if the three colors that I was using, if I had started with the Flamingo, which is a paler color, I would have felt a lot more confident about retwisting and layering other colors on top. But since the Cabernet was so dark, I was like, whatever I layer there isn't gonna be, uh, make a huge change to that Cabernet. And using something that was gonna be lighter overall, you saw how light that Flamingo was compared to the other colors. It just meant that, oh, maybe I need to just do this differently. Now, if the coverage of the Cabernet was a lot patchier, and we had a lot more white space, then I probably would have proceeded. But because I poured the dye onto yarn that wasn't saturated already, we ended up getting a lot of that color going through the yarn a little bit less resist than maybe we would have if I was either starting with dry yarn, that is an option, or if I had, once I laid the yarn in, if I added a layer of water already. So if we started off with it doesn't have to be all the way to the top, but if we added, started with yarn going at least, or water going halfway up the sides of the yarn, when I poured the dye on, yes, some of it would go in between the skeins, but more of the interior of that twisted yarn wouldn't have dye, because since there's already water in there, the dye I'm adding in isn't gonna be able to push into the yarn as easily, and it'll stay more to the outside. But since we had yarn that was not completely saturated in our pan before, when I poured the liquid on, all that dye sort of went into the yarn. If, again, I, this is my hypothesis. So I'm thinking and making ideas for the future. But I, again, I adore how this came out. And really, that's the most important thing. I forgot to turn off my overhead light. <laughs> So yeah, there is that. The light that is under my microwave has been broken for a very long time. Oh, by the way, the 30 minutes are totally up. So I'm gonna turn off the heat. Um, so yeah, the microwave light has stopped working a long time ago. So I use a magnetic rechargeable LED light, which works wonderfully. It's just, 
yeah, it <laughs> burnt out and so I can't use it right now. But oh, we see all these different pinks. I love, love the way that they've layered on. There is a hint. I would say just a hint of, actually maybe not. I thought that there was, I was gonna say there's a hint of some color in the pan. And maybe there is a tiny amount, but I'm gonna set the yarn aside to cool completely and then we can wash it. Let's wash our very, very pink yarn. Ugh, this is so, so pretty. And look at all those different tones of pink. I am so, so happy Ugh, with the way that these colors have come together. And now we just have to hope that we're not gonna have any bleeding. Now, sometimes, you might know that there would be color bleeding because you see a ton of dye left in the pot. Sometimes that's not a good indicator. So it can be hard to know for sure. But man, I think even if I had stuck with the Cabernet all over, this would still be really pretty, but I'm really glad that I sort of did that 50-50 thing. But anyway, with a little bit of pink left in the pan, we could have bleeding here. But I'm going to be optimistic. Oh, there's no bleeding. I'm doing a little dance. Um, that is great. Now, I did not use a lot of some of the colors that I know can be bleeders. So that probably helps. But sometimes Cabernet can bleed. But again, we didn't use a ton of that either. So anyway, <laughs> we are now going to finish rinsing out the soap. I'm going to put the yarn through my spin dryer, hang it up to dry and we will come back and look at the yarn. Oh, Aisha, this is so pretty. This project did not go the way I expected. Now, when I, we added dye on top of the twisted skeins, you can see we've got lovely variation up in there. And with our brighter pink, we still have variation down here too, because when we layered on the lighter shade, was it Flamingo? Honestly, I don't remember right now. Um, when we sh layered on that lighter shade, it really comes through because we had that twisted area in the middle that didn't have as much color. And so we were able to bring that lightness throughout uh, a lot of the colors. But what I didn't do was end up uh, twisting the skeins multiple times in the pan, which was my original thought. I definitely think that next time I try this kind of technique again, I need to add water to the pan at the beginning. That way, as I add in liquid, the yarn will be a little bit less of a sponge. And so therefore the dye will hit mostly on just that surface area that's exposed. And yes, at the very end, you can still layer on one color so there's no white exposed, sort of like we did here to get pastel pink in all of these pops but it's always just something to consider. And a reason why it's interesting when I sometimes try to go back and try a technique over again, but without watching the videos to see how I set it up in the past. And honestly, that's a huge learning curve in of itself. And so if you enjoy videos like this, please subscribe and turn on notifications so you never miss a new video. Oh my goodness though, I love this yarn base so much. Look at the like glazing effect that we have in there. This yarn really plumps up and gives us this beautiful round shape once it's dry. Now, all of this yarn is going to my lab partner Aisha today, but I set it up like I would photograph it, like I might for the shop, and it's just so pretty I had to have a clip of this in here. I typically try to film the yarn a little bit more straight on uh, in film versus a little more at an angle for the shop. But anyway, Aisha, thank you so much for being my lab partner for today's episode of Dye Pot Weekly. I really hope that you are going to love your yarn. If you at home would like to learn more about how you can become a lab partner, go and check out the listings in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop. Uh, lab partners get shout out in a video, you tell me some colors to avoid, and pick the yarn base, and then I will dye up some yarn for you. The final colorways are a surprise, but everything is so much fun. However, if you have a particular idea or want maybe a yarn base that isn't one that I have listed, feel free to send me a message on Etsy to chat about it before you sign up to become a lab partner. But anyway, Aisha, again, thank you so much for all of your support and for being my lab partner today. Of course, 
in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop, you'll also find a lot of ready-to-ship hand-dyed yarn that's been featured in past or upcoming videos. And the 2023 Chemnitz Hanukkah samplers are available for pre-order. For each of the eight nights of Hanukkah, there will be a new yarn dyeing video, and you'll have a corresponding package to unwrap uh, with a mini skein of yarn uh, from the colorway featured in the video. And so it's just a really fun experience and there's other extras and goodies in these samplers. And again, you can find more details in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop and I'll also have that linked down in the video description. It's, it's funny, sometimes I have trouble picking colors for a color palette. Uh, sometimes I stick to the same kind of things and the same favorite dyes over and over. And that's one reason why sometimes I play games and do live streams where I will randomly select colors or have you at home pick the colors and so it has me do something a little bit different. But I have to say one thing that is in like my comfort zone is doing something more monochromatic but trying to pick colors within one family that do have some differences as they are already mixed. But you could also do something like this without owning a lot of different pre-mixed colors. If you have a limited selection of acid dyes at your disposal, but have say a primary red and a primary fuchsia plus yellow and like a cyan or even a blue, you can take those colors, mix them to create different tones and then do something like this, layering those different tones that are ultimately mixed out of the same primaries. But by playing around with the proportions, you can create something monochromatic, but with different hues in it, like we have here. It's just sometimes the premix colors can be a little bit easier out of the gate, because <laughs> you know what you're gonna get, but absolutely, you, can't, you don't need to have all 80 plus acid dyes from Dharma, um, or all 48 colors from Jacquard to create a lot of varied different colors. But anyway, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and thank you so much for watching.